happening. So folks, um, as I said, I'm Mel English, um, and I work at Mentor, uh, Mentor National, but um, we manage the National Mentoring Resource Center grant in partnership with OJJDP. Um, this is a, uh, we're also grantees. Um, and when we say grantees, we're OJJDP grantees. Um, not everybody on um, this call are OJJDP grantees, but for those who are, Welcome. Um, and those who aren't, um, you know, you can learn more and apply for um, National Mentoring Resource Center uh, technical assistance, which is a fancy way of saying consulting. Um, through um, at the end, I'll I'll share um, a slide on that. But the National Mentoring Resource Center .org, um, we have a great um, new new site there. So the key components, when we say the National Mentoring Resource Center, we love our acronyms. So NMRC and OJJDP, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. So we have a great, um, awesome, you know, resources on that site. They're all research to practice vetted tools. So our research board um, reviews everything that's on there. We have a blog, we have a grantee dedicated part of the site. Um, we have vetted resources, evidence reviews. Um, we, you know, review who's on our research board. We have 42 members on our research board from around the world. And of course, technical assistance, um, that no cost assistance and no cost consulting for your youth mentoring program. And, um, you know, Christopher and Joanne are some of those technical assistance providers. So, and I'm sure that, you know, they'll share a little bit more with you um, in a moment about that. About mentor, you know, we're the unifying champion for mentoring, thought leader in the uh, field. We've developed the um, elements of effective practice um, that are the benchmarks for mentoring programs. And that should be learning about today. So this is, um, this is an amazing, you know, way that mentor um, collaborates with um, OJJDP um, through, you know, providing the, um, these kinds of trainings. So, um, and affiliates, um, Mentor Rhode Island is an affiliate of Mentor. Um, a lot of our affiliates provide that no cost assistance for uh, mentoring programs. More to come on that. I'll close this out um, in the, in this, and I'm going to turn it over to, um, uh, this, okay, so here's this. I'm going to, presenter mode. Okay. Christopher, can I turn it over to you? Absolutely. All right. So uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to day one of our three days together um, for the Elements of Effective Practice Mentoring. Uh, my name is Christopher Margadana. I am the Director of Training and Engagement here at Mentor Rhode Island, and just really excited to be with you all on this fine Tuesday. Um, and I'm here with my wonderful and fabulous uh, assistant here. No, just kidding. <laughs> the present CEO of Mentor at Island, Joanne Schofield. Joanne, say hello to people. Hello, everybody. Yes, I am for today, Christopher's assistant. Tomorrow he can be mine. And so uh, to kind of get us started here, um, we are going to try to have some engagement with the throughout this three days, just so that it's not us talking to you, because this can be a lot of dense material. We want you to talk to one another, really get to know one another, and lean on one another in this work, um, because we don't do this work alone. And so the first thing that we're going to do is we are going to put you into groups. And what we're going to have you do is you are going to uh, come up with seven things that you and your group uh, have in common. So what are seven things that you and your group mates have in common? And then you're going to find one thing that is different about each of you. So you'll have seven things that are, are the same, and then one thing that is different about each and every one of you. Um, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about that. So there should be about four, uh, three to four people in each group. So again, you're going to try to find seven things. If you could turn on your cameras when you're in your breakout rooms, that would be phenomenal. Um, even them having them out, out here would be great so that I can see all your beautiful shining faces. Um, I don't care, you know, if you're trying to shove food in your mouth or however. Um, so hopefully we will uh, get you to go there and you're on your way. All right, we got some more great things coming in. 
great. So my question to people is, and you know, as I kind of ask questions throughout this, you're more than welcome to use the raised hand function. If you'd like to answer a question out loud, you can write in the chat. Um, again, I'd love to hear your lovely voices. It's nice to see some of your smiling faces on the screen. So, you know, again, we're gonna be spending a lot of time together the next couple of days. So um, this is really how we start to build relationships. So how did it feel to do this activity? What did that feel like? And again, you can raise your hand, use the raise hand function, unmute yourself. Um, again, I'd like to kind of hear what people have to say, but how did it feel to do this activity? I greatly enjoyed it. It was one of the best events I've had all day. It was oh. fun. I got to know new people. I got to meet people from other parts of the country. I got to find out what things, what they liked, what they didn't like. I loved it. Great. Wonderful. Oh, that made me feel really good about this. All right. We're off to a good start here. I'm really liking this. Everyone keep the energy high. Keep the energy high. What else? What else did other feel, uh, people feel about the activity? Yeah, I um. I enjoyed it. It was fun. And it's always great to uh, meet folks in the field uh, who kind of understand the work that you're doing, because it usually takes a long time to, you know, people ask what you do. It's like, how much time you got? We do so much. Uh, so just just being around folks that kind of, you know, know the, the ins and outs, I think is always great. Yeah, great. Thank you. How else did people feel? Or how did this activity make people feel? Like I said, don't be afraid to unmute. We're gonna get real close here, real fast. Megan. Yeah, is you know our group was great. There were just three of us, and we concentrated pretty much on our how our organizations were like or different, as opposed to our personal things. So I'm sorry that we didn't do the personal things, because that would have been fun. But it was it was good. We we had a good group. We'll have more breakout rooms, so you have more time to ask those questions and talk to people, I promise. Yeah, so as far as kind of this activity, you know, why would we do an activity like this? What's the point of doing something like this? You're looking at the diversity of a group and, and your the ability to interact and um, accept each other for who you are and the things that you do differently, as well as what you see in common. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it's also a reminder that we have a lot more in common than we do um, different. So that's always good to be reminded of. Absolutely. And I think I sometimes I love this activity because a lot of times people will be like, oh, you know, well, three of us had this, but the one person didn't. Or, you know, you go through that list a hundred times. They're like, oh, do we all like this thing? And that one person's like, no, I don't. And so, right, there is a lot more that's uh, the same about us and what's different. Exactly. Um, other reasons on why we would do this or, or the reason behind this? Again, I think it's a really great way to just start this off to kind of get to know one another. And we talk about building relationships, right? It's just that simple kind of base layer of what do you have in common with a person? You know, when we talk about our young people being with one another and connecting with uh, mentors and mentees, right? Finding that commonality, finding that common ground between them, because sometimes it can be so hard. And it's about asking good questions and getting to know one another that starts that relationship off, right? Then you can start to say like, oh, well, we both like pizza. Well, what do you like under pizza? Oh, where do you get your pizza from, right? And of course, we're from all across the country, so that might be a little harder. But, you know, you understand, right, when it comes down to like on a local level in those types of ways. So again, I think it's always great to kind of get to know some people, have a little bit of fun, right, before we really get into some dense learning today. Um, as we are about to dive into the elements of effective practice. What I'd love to know, though, is on a scale of one to five, and you can put this in the chat, scale of one to five, how well are you versed in recruiting and recruitment? So five is like, I'm the best recruiter in the world. I ask a person and they become a mentor right away. And one is like, oh, I don't really know anything about recruitment. I can just about spell the word. So what do we, what do we got here? All right, lots of twos, a big a fan of twos, big fan of twos. All right, <laughs> Tim, I love the ones. All right, listen, I'm all about it. We're ready for it here, everybody. Threes, some twos. All right, 2.5. Three, okay. Yes, 
Yeah, so our element for today is recruitment. We are spending the rest of the time here today on recruitment because we know how important recruiting is. And without the right mentors and mentees in your program, then you have no program, right? And so we think that this is a great place to start. And um, my background here at Mentor Rhode Island, I was hired originally as the recruitment specialist here. Uh, it was kind of the first of its kind in the affiliate. Um, and so I was tasked with getting 250 mentors a year for our different programs throughout the state of Rhode Island. Um, I will tell you, I never hit 250, but I was pretty close. I hit about 180 in my second year. So um, I like to say that was pretty good on my part. So I know a little bit around recruitment and hopefully we'll kind of talk through some stuff and really understand the best practices in recruitment to help you become great recruiters as well when it comes to recruiting mentors and mentees. All right. Everyone ready for us to kind of jump into this? Everyone's like, I'm ready for the information, Christopher. Give it to me. Give me all of it. All right, here we go. There's Joanne and I. We're so pretty. All right. So the elements of effective practice, right? There are six different elements that we're going to go through over the next three days. That first one being recruitment, which we were just talking about. Then we'll go over screening of mentors and mentees, training of mentors and mentees, then the matching, that monitoring and support piece, and then closure. Within the elements of effective practice for mentoring uh, book here, the fourth edition, there's also a program management piece, which you can see we won't go over much of that, if any, over the next three days, but it's a great thing to look at. The other thing that's really great about the elements and all the research that's been coming out is that we've realized how important it is to be so specific on the model of mentoring. And so there are lots of supplements out there as well, based on your model and program goals. And so we have supplements related to STEM mentoring, peer and group models, e-mentoring. There's an LGBTQ one working with um, young men of color. So it's a lot of different supplements there, depending on your program models and goals, that would really be great to look at. The Elements of Effective Practice focuses on that one-to-one -one community piece. So that's really what we're gonna be revolving around when we talk about the elements, but then thinking about how does it adapt to your program uh, model and goal. I will say that a hundred times. What is your goal and your objectives for your program? Because that is what is going to be beneficial to you as we talk about all of this. Great. So what are the elements of effective practice for mentoring? They're research-informed practices. We didn't make these up. They were actually researched for many, many years. We've had these around and we're on the fourth edition. Um, I heard maybe down the line, there would be a fifth edition, if you can believe it. There's some more research being done in mentoring. Um, they're evidence-based standards and benchmarks. So each element, um, each standard has benchmarks that you should be hitting to have the most effective program that you could possibly have. And then they have what's called enhancements. And these are things that you don't necessarily need in your program, but would be really beneficial to you to have a really phenomenal program. Um, and then recommendations on program management, leadership, evaluation, and core principles, youth mentoring, and organizations are, again, are also in there. Disclaimer. I'm not a lawyer. I don't claim to be a lawyer. I just play one on TV. So we are, this is not legal advice. Do not take this as legal advice. I'm saying it now on this recording, right? Um, I am not from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. So I have no justice background. Um, so just know that again, this is not a, uh, there's no legality here. All right, benchmark for standard one, mentor recruitment. So first what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of read through these. I may expound upon a couple of them, but then as we go throughout today's presentation, we'll dive in a little bit more, okay? And if you have a question at any time, you can always drop it in the chat. You can always unmute yourselves. You can always raise your hand. Please, I want this to be as engaging as possible. We will have a couple activities that I have you do. Um, but again, if you have any questions at any time, please just like shout it out. Say, Christopher, stop, stop, hold up right there. Red light, I need to ask you a question about this. All right, here we go. So uh, benchmark one is uh, engages for mentor recruitment is engages in recruitment strategies that realistically portray the benefits, practices, supports, and challenges of being uh, challenges of mentoring in the program. Number two is utilizes recruitment strategies that build positive attitudes and emotions about mentoring. Three is recruits mentors whose skills, motivations, backgrounds best match the goals and structures of the program. Again, we always want to go back to your programs, models, and goals. 
encourages mentors to assist with the recruitment efforts by providing them with resources to ask individuals they know who meet the eligibility criteria of the program to be a mentor. The best people to recruit are those who are in your program who are actively volunteering already. And then trains and encourages mentees to identify and recruit appropriate mentors for themselves when relevant, um, which can also be really great. Engages in recruitment strategies that realistically portray the benefits, practices, supports, and challenges of being mentored in the program, right? So it's from the mentee side. Recruits mentees whose needs best match the services offered by the program. And then we're looking at our enhancements. So again, those were all things that you should be doing. These are things that would, again, be great for you to be doing, but not necessarily something you need to do. So the program communicates to mentors about how mentoring and volunteering can benefit them. The program has a publicly available written statement outlining eligibility requirements for mentors in the program, what I call the mentor job description. Uh, the program uses multiple strategies to recruit mentors, whether it be that direct task, social media, traditional methods of mass communication, presentations, referrals, on an ongoing basis. You know, you wanna make sure you're recruiting mentors over and over and over throughout the year. The program has a publicly available written statement outlining the eligibility requirements for mentees in the program. What's that mentee job description? What do I have to do as a mentee in your program? The program encourages mentees to recruit other peers to be mentees whose needs match the services offered by the program when relevant. All right, so our learning outcomes for this section is to define a targeted recruitment audience for potential mentors and mentees. Recruit appropriate mentors and mentees by realistically describing the program's aims and expectations, and then develop a targeted plan to recruit mentors and mentees. So that's what we've got here. Now, we are gonna do kind of an opening activity in this section. We already did like an opening, opening activity. So that was like the pre-show. This is like, again, we're kind of the opening act here. So I want you to think about a positive volunteer experience and what made it positive for you. We're gonna drop a link to the Jamboard in the chat and through that Jamboard, what you're going to do is you're gonna create a little sticky note and you're gonna just name the positive volunteer experience. I don't need you to write anything else other than what that positive volunteer experience was. So if you volunteered at a food bank, just put food bank. Or um, if you were you know, volunteering in some other capacity, right? you're just gonna write what that is. No need to write what made it positive, but just write that on the sticky note there to the left. So you'll see under kind of that cursor, there's something that looks like a sticky note. And you're just going to, again, put that somewhere on the board. If you run out of room here on page one, you can go to page two and also put something. Um, but if we can fit it all on page one, that would be great. But, you know, I had to fit those OJJDP logos and the National Mentoring Resource logos, and they wouldn't let me take those away. I'd get yelled at if I did. So a little less room than I wanted. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call on a couple of people to, uh, to talk about that volunteer experience and what made it positive for you. So again, yep, you'll click right there to the left where you see the cursor is and make a sticky note. You can change the color of the sticky note like some people have. It doesn't have to be yellow. That's so boring sometimes. Make it pink, make it blue, change it up. And then you can move them over. So they're all kind of in that, they all end up in that one area. So we're gonna just move them around. Look at all these great volunteer experiences everybody has. All right. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start calling on a few people. Um, unless anyone would like to volunteer to say what their positive volunteer experience was. I guess I'll have you volunteer. Um, so if anyone wants to volunteer, talk about what their positive volunteer experience was. Uh, Raphael. Um, yeah, so um, I've volunteered a lot, but um, I think to date, my favorite has been with the uh, the Coast Guard Auxiliary. Um, you know, a lot of fun and and have a uh, sense of purpose uh, to my community and to um, active service members. We get to uh, help out, relieve them some of their duties and support in, in most of their, their, uh, their missions. And uh, my brother was in the Coast Guard. Um, and he passed away a few years ago. And so it makes me feel close to him, uh, you know, when I throw on the uniform and stuff. So um, I really, I really enjoy it. 
Great. Yeah, no. So there's lots of reasons why that made that a positive experience for you. Um, and that's great to hear that there are multiple reasons that made it great. Wonderful. Who else would anyone else like to share before I start calling on people? Anyone else want to share kind of their positive volunteer experience and what made it positive for you? I volunteered for Habitat for Humanity. And I loved it. I worked with a wonderful group of people. We got to put together a house together, which I had never done before. Of course, we didn't put together the whole thing, <laughs> but we had a good time. Great. I volunteered for the Foster Care Support Foundation, which as a facility distributed free medical services to the both foster care and kinship care. Um, and it was, I was very fortunate to grow up with new underwear for the first time and started crying and that just touched my heart and now I actually work for them just many years later um, and it just broke my heart that some kids don't have um, the support that they need and so that was that was what really started my whole my whole career now. great thank you so much Jordan it was a little hard to hear you but talking about um, volunteering in foster care um, was was what they were talking about there. So wonderful, thank you. Another volunteer experience that was positive for people. I promise you there's a reason why I'm asking you this question. Yeah, I'll go, hi. I volunteered hi. through the Office of Children and Families in the city of Philadelphia as a reading coach to elementary school students. And uh, it's a program that combines early reading support with access to books. And I just started uh, this school year and it's been absolutely great. We're in person with them and the kids are just super eager to come and read with us. And they also are able to take home books at the end of our sessions. That's wonderful. Anything else, anyone else wanna share? I volunteered. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. You're good. I volunteered to uh, Christmas giveaways, it's like a tree a tree thing. We're packaging gifts and collecting gifts for uh, students and kids that uh, were unfortunate, less fortunate, and couldn't buy Christmas gifts. And to see their faces light up and parents light up for them to be able to receive some things they thought they would never get but wanted. Uh, that's an amazing kind of an experience that changes kids' lives as well as the mentors. That's amazing. I love it. Donna. Uh, I volunteered for a children's clothes closet, but it was a unique one in that the, they, they kind of go shopping with the family and the whole family is involved with this and they get to pick out three to five outfits depending on the age. So it was not only about the clothes, but it was finding able to find out what other needs there were and sometimes we could help address those too. So it was a really great experience. Great. One of my favorite volunteer experiences that I can remember is going uh, every holiday season, going to different nursing homes and hospitals uh, to sing to people who were there, um, who couldn't get out, who couldn't experience any of that. And it was just something about being there and, and that feeling of, of bringing joy to people. I think that we all bring when we volunteer, right? We're all looking for that, uh, for that feeling. So I like doing this activity to get us started when we talk about mentor recruitment because we wanna remember why do we volunteer, right? What makes us wanna volunteer for something and be a part of something? That's what we need to think about when we're trying to recruit our mentors. Why would they wanna volunteer with us? Why would they wanna be there? And how can we make it a positive experience for them? At the end of the day, we wanna make sure that we are making a positive volunteer experience. So why is recruitment so important? right? Of potential mentors who, um, of potential mentors of that express interest, how many actually become mentors? So again, how many people do you need to ask to get one mentor is usually the question, All right? How many people do you need to ask to get one mentor? What do you think? Put that in the chat now. How many people do you think you need to ask to recruit one mentor? All right, we got 
35, 5, 10, 25, 10, 26, 12, 7, 10, 5, 5, 30, 20, 25, 15, 10, 25. And again, this is to get them like from start to finish, right? You from the ask to being match with the child. Five, 10, nine, 35, 10, 30. So the number I usually tell people is it's about uh, 40 to one. You need to ask 40 people to be a mentor, right? To get one. And I'm talking from start to finish, right? You may go somewhere and you may get, you know, 25 people to sign up. How many people of those 25 people actually become mentors? How many people actually answer your phone calls? How many people actually attend the training? How many people actually pass a background check, right? All of those different pieces that come into play. And this is a lot of the times when I say it's 40 to one when we're talking about this thing called warm body recruitment. Right, this idea that when you're recruiting, that you know you're looking at a large number of volunteers in a short amount of time with limited qualifications. Right, there's no need for them to be there. That's if you go and stand outside the grocery store or like run down the street and say, "I'm looking for mentors." Right, to do that, you're gonna have to pass 40 people before you get one person. Right, in that space. Uh, so, Joanne, if you go on to the next slide, that would be great. So again, yes, yeah, so we're talking about that warm body recruitment. But what we really want and what we really need to focus on is that targeted recruitment piece. So you want a smaller audience with specific skills and not commonly found characteristics. And in that time, you're only asking about five in one, right? Because you're getting really, really specific on who you want and who is going to be a mentor in your program. So the more specific you can get on who you want, the easier it's going to be to recruit. Um, a lot of the times when we just say, hey, do you want to be a mentor? They're like, well, who am I going to be serving? What is that program? What is that uh, going to look like? And so we'll kind of get into a few of those things later on to talk a little bit more about how specific we should be getting. So that need for targeted recruitment, it avoids early match termination. One third to one half of matches end early. And matches that were less than three months have a negative impact on the youth. Think about that, right? This youth finally gets matched with a mentor. They think this is gonna be a great thing for them. They've heard great things about the mentor program, about having a mentor, what it's like to have a mentor. They may have been through some training on having a mentor, and then that person leaves less than three months in. And now it's just another adult coming into their lives and letting them down. So these are things that we definitely wanna look for and kind of keep an eye out when we're making sure that we are targeting our mentor so that they stay with our program. So top reasons matches end. Now, this wonderful, wonderful page, we will see a number of times throughout this training, um, not only today, but tomorrow and Thursday. So you'll see this there um, because it's really is gonna ground us in why matches end. And that's the last thing we want is a match to end for, for a bad reason, right? We want a match to end because the kid has hit the end of the program, right? Or they've aged out. But sometimes matches end because of mentors' unfulfilled expectations. It wasn't what you said it was going to be, right? You said, oh, yeah, it's super easy. All you got to do is this. And then all of a sudden you had me mentoring for 40 hours a month, right? So we want to make sure that we're being upfront with mentors on what that looks like and what our expectations are of them. Deficiencies in mentors' relational skills, including cultural competency. They just don't know how to deal with youth who are different than they are in any capacity. Perceived lack of mentee motivation. The mentee just doesn't seem like they wanna be a part of this program. I always say, you know, a mentee will never tell you that they love you. They might write it, they'll never say it, right? So we wanna make sure that we are engaging mentors in that way, that they know that the mentee wants to be there. Family interference in some way, um, the family may interfere with the mentor and ask too much of the mentor. The family may interfere and take the kid out of the program because they're you know, the family doesn't like the way that the kid is talking about the mentor. You know, um, there are lots of different ways that the family can interfere. And then that last one, that last one falls on us mostly, right? Inadequate agency support. I bet you none of you would have thought that was a positive volunteer opportunity if there wasn't agency support behind you, right? It was organized, people knew what they were doing, you knew where to be and where to go, right? That makes all the difference, makes all the difference when you have that agency backing you. 
So mentor and mentee uh, recruitment approach should target a specific audience that will best match with the goals of your program, right? Always keep your goals of your program top of mind when you're recruiting. Think about who you want and who you're serving because that is who you're going to want there. And it should realistically portray the benefits, requirements, and supports and challenges up front. If you need your mentors to you know, attend a mentor training that is 12 hours long, they need to know that up front. If they need to pass a number of background checks, they need to know that up front. If they know that this youth uh, maybe had some uh, gang affiliation previously, they need to know that up front so that they can, you know, agree to that and you know that you're going to have somebody there for you. Any questions so far on any? All right, so now we're gonna get into defining your audience. And so for this, again, it's about getting really um, detailed on who you're serving, right? So this is a great idea of thinking about who are your mentees? What are their demographics? What are their interests and hobbies? And what are their challenges and barriers? I'd love for you right now to take a moment in the chat to write about what are those ch challenges and barriers of your youth? What are things that the young people are going through in your program that are challenges and barriers for them? Lack of motivation, vulnerability with adults, stigmas and fears, fear of connecting, living below the poverty line, neighborhood violence, impacted by incarceration, experiencing foster care, affording college, trust in general, lack of focus. Impacted by substance abuse disorder. Feeling like no one cares not seeing someone like them, definitely a challenge. A lack of support, admitting their problems, violence, stigma, social media. When we start thinking about all the things that our young people and the challenges and barriers that they have specifically within a program, think about this. Some of you are saying some real hard hitting things that they're dealing with some, a lot of different stuff. And what mentors would be best for those kinds of young people that you're serving, right? Is it the retiree, right? Is that maybe the mentor that we want for someone who is dealing with a parent who's been incarcerated? Maybe, depends on other factors and we'll kind of get into some of that. But really getting into what are the things that young, young people are challenging with and how can a mentor help and who is that person? What specific life experiences do they have? What area of expertise do they have? What are their motivations for mentoring? What are the demographics? What do your mentors look like? These are all things that you wanna get really, really specific about those ideal mentors that you want. Make the list, right? Make the list, the big list of what do you want? What's the, if I could have it my way, what would these mentors look like? And now where do you find those people? Where do you go to find the people that help can help the kids that are uh, that have those challenges and barriers that we've talked about? You don't just want somebody, right, to be there with your kid. You don't want a body, somebody. You want somebody who's going to be there and show up time and time again. So now we're going to identify the benefits of being a mentor because this is what we need to do. And this is uh, when we're looking at this enhancement, right? This is enhancement one. But I think that this enhancement is really good to really talk about because when we can think about what's the benefit of being a mentor, we can think about it in two different ways. We can look at the tangible benefits, whether that be learning a specific skill, uh, maybe a specific excursion, activities, um, transportation reimbursement, right? Something they can actually like feel, touch, right? And be there for. But then there's also those intangible benefits. So maybe an increased sense of purpose and building relationships. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you into groups again, just what everybody wanted to go back into groups. And what I want you to do is I want you to create a list of all the benefits you can think of of being a mentor, whether it's in your program or something else. I want you to think of all the benefits that you can have of being a mentor, whether that be tangible or intangible. And then we're going to come back and I want to see kind of what you guys came up for lists. All right, so think of both tangible and intangible. Give you one big list. Uh, and I'm not going to give you a lot of time for this because I really want you to think through quickly what are those benefits right off the top of your head? What could we provide to mentors? How can we make this the best experience for them? And what are the benefits of volunteering as a mentor in your program? So it can be benefits you already have or benefits you're like, oh, you know what? Actually, this could be a cool thing we could do. Have a trip to Six Flags, right? Transportation reimbursement, whatever that may be, okay? So we are going to put you into groups now. All right, hello, hello, welcome back, here we are. Um, so hopefully you came up with these amazing lists of all the benefits to be a mentor in your program or just like a general mentor in any program. Um, so anyone wanna share that list or would you like to write them in the chat? Either one, you can write some in the chat. You, I'd rather you say them out loud though, personally. I'll share our list. Um, so most of it was about being of service and being part of the community and the, uh, you know, a lot of my mentors and uh, all of our mentors mentioned how they felt like they were being an active part of the community. And that was a heartwarming part of the, what they do. Um, I also, with my program, try to, because we, we have volunteers and they pay for out of, out of pocket for all the activities they do with their mentees. And so, um, we try to find freebies for them all the time. We try to have sponsored events like horseback riding and baseball games and whatnot. So, um, so we try to make sure that we also have things for them that are enriching for both them and the mentee to do together that they, they will both enjoy um, beyond just the you know, feel good kind of, uh, of, of being a mentor. Yeah, right. Having those free events, wonderful to be able to just guide people easily to that big, big benefit to be a mentor in that program. Great. So we had, um, we had um, structure and guidance. So have somebody, uh, the child, the youth have somebody who's a confidant. They needed individualized attention, practical experience, um, teach accountability, empathy, mutual engagement, uh, doing something impactful or positive building communication skills. And I think that was it. I think that was it. Great, a wonderful list of benefits. Great things that you can get out of being a mentor in a program. Great. Um, what else? Um, in our group, we talked about um, the young people feeling valued and them being able to teach their mentor something, um, technology, the latest slang or hip hop or whatever's going on in their life. Um, we talked about um, the mentors developing relationships with the other mentors, um, learning the new skill and um, all of the other things that the other previous groups listed as well. Great, and I'm, I'm so happy there was some overlap there. I really love the teaching another, uh, teaching the meant to be able to teach the mentor something, right? And being able to learn something there. I'm surprised you did not put TikTok dances though on that list of things they could learn, but absolutely, right? Lots of things that young people can teach mentors. That's great. I see that Kevin put in the chat a long list here of great things. Great. I could share if I great. could. Great, of course. Yeah, um, so one of the things I mentioned to, to my group is, um, I think um, having employers that support mentoring. Um, so we've been really um, strategic on making sure that we have those partnerships. So uh, mentors get paid to come during their lunch hour and hang out with a student. Um, another great part too is some mentors carpool together and they carpool together and come to the mentoring site and they meet with students. So 
that not only like helps build that like um, bonding at work from mentor for mentors at their employer at, um, at their workspace, but it gets um, you know mentors to come here and have um, have a ride here and then still get paid to hang out with the students. So I think those are good benefits. Yeah, absolutely. Any other benefits we can think of? Whether or not they're for your program and other program. Something like, oh, I just thought of this would be a great benefit of being a mentor. One thing that we talked about that's kind of intangible is just that sense of fulfillment that mentors receive from doing it. Um, in our mentor trainings, we always ask our mentors, like, what's your reason for mentoring? And it's really beautiful because every time we ask that, we get a different answer. Um, but I would say a really common theme that we see is something related to, you know, just that desire to give back. Um, you know, so many people that mentor share that they mentor because they've had mentors in their life that make an impact um, and that they want to give back in that way. Um, and so they kind of tie that into just that sense of like, I'm making an impact and that, you know, just to be fulfilled in what they're doing and how they're serving. Great. Something that I know we all love and somehow seem to forget is like, we love free stuff, everybody. So like, that's also a benefit, right? Do you have t-shirts? Do you have water bottles? Do you have, you know, baseball caps? Do you give away free food at events, right? Do they get gift cards? Like those things also can be a benefit and that's okay, right? That that's like something you do, but you know, what does that look like and all of those different things? I know if I, you know, was gonna be a mentor in a program and they said, oh, you get a free t-shirt. I'm like, I'm already in. You had me at free, truly, honestly. So, right, what are those things that motivate people to mentor? You know, there is definitely that, that um, intangible piece, but also, again, one of those tangible things. Oh, you know, we go on a trip to the zoo every year. We go to this amusement park every year. You know, those are different things too that mentors can enjoy as well and can be a big benefit, not only for like doing it, but also, again, that kind of um, big event piece at the end as well. Great. Anything else anyone would like to add around benefits? So I'll drop my address in the chat and y'all send me all your t-shirts, okay? I will rep them all the time. Love a good free t-shirt. Um, great. So when we're going back to looking at our benefits, we kind of have a little uh, official list here you know, of things, right? So our top volunteer motivators is enhancing their career, right? It's going to look good on a resume, maybe something that would will get them uh, to another place, um, enriching personal development, learning new skills, um, conforming to the norms of others, right? If everyone else is doing it, I want to do it too, um, escaping negative feelings, and then putting altruistic beliefs into practice. Um, so those are just, again, some reasons why people um, volunteer. All right, so now we've talked about those benefits, right? So we've talked about, well, why should I be a mentor? What's the benefit of being a mentor? But now we know on the other end, there are definitely some barriers that are in the way uh, that stop people from being a mentor. And so what I'm gonna have you do is I'm gonna have you go to a, um, go to menti.com and we're gonna drop this link right in the chat for you. And you're gonna type in the bubble. It's gonna be a word cloud. What keeps mentors from volunteering in your program? If you can think of just like a word, if you think of like a word of why mentors, what keeps mentors from volunteering in your program? And of course, I like lost the page. So clearly I'm on it, everybody. Don't you worry. I don't know where it went. Here we go. And now I'm going to share my screen. Because where's my Zoom page? So barriers to being a mentor in your program. So if you click on the link, it should just bring you right there to be able to enter in a word. And maybe it works, everybody. He said. Is it not working? Did it not work? Try it. 
try this one, he said. I must have put the wrong link. Try this one instead. Hey, there we go. So barriers to being a mentor in your program. We've got that one big word in the middle there, everybody. <laughs> big word in the middle there, time. But I definitely see a couple of other overlapping things when we're looking at this. So not only do we see time as being one, but I see fear, commitment, You know, we have the fear of the unknown, fear of not connecting, that inadequacy. Right. We have a big one with people feeling like they're not going to have like the world is up to you, that they're that they're not going to be an adequate mentor, right? That they they feel like this is going to be too over their head. Maybe they're not going to be good enough. You know, you want to work with them. Yeah. Absolutely. I've had a lot of mentors. I always tell them one of my favorite stories to tell is about I went to go do a recruitment presentation at a bank and I knew the woman and she was so excited to have me come and give the presentation. And so I give the presentation and uh, after I'm like, oh, are you going to sign up to be a mentor? And she's like, oh, well, I could never do that. And I was like, but you have so much faith in your staff, but you can be a mentor. You're a mentor to them every day. You're their manager, right? You're already mentoring. And she's like, oh, well, I just would be so afraid I would let a kid down, right? Um, great. Yeah. So that length of the commitment, background checked expenses, um, time commitment, time conflict, during work hours, again, more time stuff. Any other barriers that you've seen or any other kind of stories like that that you've seen around um, not having mentors in a, in a program or those barrier pieces? Uh, yeah, just the amount of time it takes to become a mentor. So having to do all of the trainings and submitting your paperwork and getting the background checks. Um, I know personally for me, I started in November to become a mentor through another program and I just got matched with a mentee this month and I have not met them yet. <laughs> so just that time process and becoming a mentor, I know we'll have a lot of uh, drop off from people. Yeah, absolutely. How quickly can you get people through the process? The other thing um, and sometimes, the population that you're looking at in terms of who are the mentees and where are they coming from, what community you're coming from versus versus uh, the mentors or where they're at. And so that hesitancy, can I relate to that kind of thing? Yeah, there's that fear. It's the fear of the unknown, right? Um, I definitely think that that plays a big, big role in this as far as a barrier. We can't get out of our own way. Any other barriers you want to lift up or any other stories or any other things that you've seen? I think that there's a big difference in one-on-one um, -on -one programs versus, you know, group group programs, because I think that if you're on a one-on-one -on -one program, the mentor feels like they have to be the sole provider of everything. Um, and sometimes in group programs, you feel like you have more support and you'll have somebody else there with you and, you know, if you are feeling if you're feeling overwhelmed, then you can have somebody else there that, that can help you out. So we're a one-on-one -on -one program. So I feel like that that can be a limitation just in and of itself is just the fact that mentors are knowing that they're going to be spending one-on-one -on -one time with the mentee, you know. And how can you gear somebody up during a mentor training to not feel that way, to not feel like it's their sole responsibility to help this young person? Um, and how can you provide them that? I always say that the mentor is central admin. So all questions are funneled through the mentor, but then the mentor should be farming them out to where they need to go. Um, and so how do you get people to think that way and say, you don't have to take on all this information, right? And it's not your job to, to help them in every way. We call that the board of directors with our, with our training. So you have a board of directors. So you have, you have your mentor coordinator, and then we have but then also there's going to be neighbors and friends and family members that have teenagers or whatever age group you're working with that you can work out with. We call that your board of directors. 
That's great. I love that. Great. All right, so we can bring that back up our slides here. So there are lots of barriers, we can see them. And again, those common barriers include that time commitment piece, that lack of interest, eligibility requirements, and then the geographic barriers can sometimes be a limitation. Here in Rhode Island, we are a very small state. It takes an hour to drive anywhere in Rhode Island. And yet, if you have to go over 20 minutes anywhere, people aren't driving there. So we see that a lot here in Rhode Island and we're in itty bitty state. Um, so do your recruitment materials realistically describe your program's aims and, and expected outcomes? Do they highlight the benefits and do they proactively address the potential barriers to participating? Remember why mentors drop out of programs because those expectations were not set up front. And so we want to make sure that we are being as real with mentors as possible, right? A lot of the times we feel like we're selling them an experience, right? Sell, 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 get more mentors in the door. We need more mentors because we need to serve these kids. But at the same time, to put all that money and energy behind someone who's just going to drop out less than three months into the program is not good. So ask for what you want up front. Now, of course, we talked earlier about building relationships. And that's what recruiters are. Recruiters build relationships. And so with these recruitment sources, I will say, a little outdated. We're looking at 2006 here. So these might be a little different. But I think it does a really good job of thinking that no matter what decade we're in, no matter what we're looking at, 23% recruited by a friend, that is a quarter of the people. If people enjoy your program, if they're having a positive volunteer experience, they're gonna ask their friends to be a part of it. If you're creating community for mentors, they're gonna wanna be a part of it. Um, if you have great benefits of being a mentor, people are gonna wanna be a part of it. And they're gonna tell their friends. How many people here on this call told your friends or people in your family about how great it was to volunteer wherever you were? How many people dragged their friends along to the next time they did it, right? We have to think in that kind of a way, right? People wanna be, in this experience, you are giving this volunteer a marvelous opportunity to change the life of a young person. Treat it as such. So we say 23 recruited by a friend, 12 by a coworker. We already talked earlier about how during the workday, right? It makes you feel better. 11% internet, I'm sure that number is a little different. 9% newspaper, I'm sure that number is a little bit different. And then 37% from other sources, whether it be church, school, teacher, radio, social media, right? I don't know if you'd call that under maybe internet. So what does that look like? And how can we make sure that we're diversifying our sources of how we get mentors into our programs? You shouldn't always use the same method because if you use the same method, you're always gonna get the same kind of people. And that's, that's specifically what you're looking for. But I think that all of your kids aren't the same. So we wanna make sure that we're diversifying our recruitment sources. Like I said earlier, that recruiter equals that relationship builder. You are in charge of the relationship. So if you want someone to have a relationship with your program, you need to build a relationship with them. People are four times more likely to do something if there's a personal ask. You don't know how many times I put on my Facebook page, hey, I want you to be a mentor. I want you to be a part of this program, right? People are like, that's nice, that's great, right? But sometimes I have a kid who, is in a program and I'm like, oh, I really need someone for this, someone for this kid. And I will personally reach out. I will call someone, I will Facebook message them, I'll slide into their DMs, right? And I will ask them to be a mentor because I have a specific kid with a specific skill set that I know you would be the best mentor for them. And I did that in one of our programs when I first started recruiting. Um, I had a young woman who was in a program and they needed a mentor for her. And I said, I have the perfect person. I had to ask this person, this person knew I worked here, this person knew that I did mentoring. The second I had a kid for her, she was all in. Uh, and she was an amazing mentor and they still talk to this day. And that's all of five years later. So it's really cool to make sure, uh, to be able to be that relationship builder, right? To see that um, in two people and be able to connect them together like that. But you gotta ask. Same thing with fundraising for those of you who do that, you gotta ask. Joanne's happy I said that. So 
When we talk about relationship building key questions, think about your own recruitment networks. Who are the people you know? Or who are the people that you know that know people, right? Six degrees of separation. In Rhode Island, it's like two degrees of separation. It's truly, I always say our unofficial state motto is I know a guy, right? I know somebody. And if I don't know somebody, I know somebody who knows somebody. Uh, so how can you draw on your existing relationships, but then how can you, uh, how can your current mentors and mentees be involved in that recruitment process? If they love your program, if they stand behind your program, if they believe in your program, then they're going to get people to be involved in your program. And there's not going to be a need to have to recruit over and over again, because they love your program so much. They want other people to be involved with it. They want other people to be changed by your program because your program is so great. All right sharing your message. So what I want you to do now is I want you to take time to create that volunteer pitch. And this will kind of be like our little break work session thing. Uh, so you'll have a few minutes to do this. And so what I want you to do is I want you to create that volunteer pitch and you're gonna use these three statements, right? That I have here on the screen. So you're gonna state the client's needs, state what the mentee needs. Right? What are those needs we talked about earlier? Right? What are those benefits? Um, I'm sorry, the barriers of the mentee. What are they? What are they going through? Explain how to help. How can the mentor help that mentee? What can they do? And then I want you to articulate the benefit of being a mentor in the program. Right? So that's what you're going to do. You're going to state what the mentee needs, how the mentor can help, and what is the benefit to the mentor for doing so. Okay. So I'm gonna give you about 10 minutes to do this. So take a little break, think it through. Don't overthink it, truly, honestly, boom, boom, boom. Okay? Because we wanna create a concise recruitment message and that volunteer pitch, okay? So you have 10 minutes and then we'll come back and uh, we will share what you have. We are back everyone, hello, hello. We are back in action. This is 335. So hopefully everyone had was able to take some time to write down their volunteer pitch. Now this of course is everyone's favorite time where I'd love for you to share um, what your volunteer pitch is so that we can all hear it. Um, that would be wonderful. I'm sure you've done a wonderful job. So if anyone would like to share, we'd love to hear it. So my volunteer pitch, okay. I just, I get out of the way because that way nobody, you know, I'm done and it's over with, right? <laughs> um, volunteer pitches, my client's need. She will be a first generation uh, potential college student. She's a senior in high school and trying to make a, a determination whether she should go on to college uh, because she's coming from a single parent household where the finances are not there uh, and, and, and she's not sure if they'll have money or should she take a trade or something like that. The volunteer that I have is, is a college graduate who went to work for, in corporate America for a while, but she decided to open up her own business and she has a chain of bakeries. So you've got uh, uh, that entrepreneurship in the volunteer, and you've got a client, uh, a mentee, potential mentee, who has all those interests, and you've got a, a, a person who could potentially help her navigate through. Though the client wants to get into clothing, and, and the culinary is kind of different, there is a benefit for being able to share her experiences to also be able to shadow her in a business, uh, uh, introduce her to other entrepreneurs uh, and really open up her interest and help her, help her even make decisions about school or not school, the pros and cons about it. So that's it in a nutshell. I could go to another one, but that's, that's good enough. Absolutely, Calvin, thank you so much, right? So of course, stay in that client's need and how can that mentor help? Wonderful. Who else wants to share what they came up with? Well, I put that our mentors are, that we service are from a disadvantaged community and or background. 
our clients and mentees, our clients slash mentees, need a positive person or role model to have a positive influence and impact in their lives. Mentors are often the only constant positive adult in the mentees' lives. If you volunteer, you can give our youth the individualized attention, structure, and guidance, and mutual engagement that they often do not receive. The benefits that we offer are long-lasting and life-changing for the youth in our program. You would walk away with a person who sees you as having a positive impact in their lives, someone who taught them life skills and the meaning of accountability and relationship building. We will support you in your mentor journey with consultation, training, engagement with your mentee if needed, and also offer field trips, a free t-shirt, and group involvement with other mentors slash mentees. Yes, we mentioned the free t-shirt in there. I remember you. Right? Free t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and do you see what I pulled out of that whole thing you said? I said free t-shirt. All right, I'm in. Right. So, and then that gives the mentor now a chance. You've given them, right, what is the mentee's need? How can the mentor help? And then what are those benefits? And now they can ask you any follow-up questions, right? Because they're going to ask you follow-up questions. You're not expecting to say the whole thing kind of in the first fell swoop, but you give everyone enough information that they want to ask questions is really kind of the, the hope behind this pitch. Somebody else. It's truly that simple. I mean, typically, I, 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 would, I would almost mirror what she said, but typically, I will kind of give an, an example of one of our, like one of the mentees that have been through our program and the benefits that they've had. Um, but you know, that youth need this individual attention, and that it's it's really just about being there and showing up, and not about the activity that you're doing. It's not about um, you know, being the, being able to know all the answers or anything like that. It's about being there and showing up and saying, you matter. So when I say I'm going to be there on Sundays at two o'clock, I show up at Sundays at two o'clock and I'm telling you that you matter in that way. And then our youth do realize that that, that really changes their whole scope of, because if you don't think that you matter, then your behavior doesn't matter. Your words don't matter. Your, your, um, you know, your actions don't matter. So once youth are able to find at least one person that youth voice is a huge part of our program. And so um, being able to have that one-on-one -on -one individual attention, but also be able to have a navigable um, route in your life and say, this is where I'm looking for. Could we maybe do this today? Um, and then the mentor saying, yes, it's life-changing for the mentee because they don't get to have that individual attention. They don't get to have somebody that's saying, hey, you matter. What do you want to do? And so that's kind of, that's kind of our pitch is that typically we're, we just, if you, if you go jogging every Sunday, um, you could just say, I'll, I'll match you with the mentee that likes to go jogging. And maybe you guys go jogging every Sunday and then you don't even have to interrupt your schedule that much. And then maybe you'll get a protein shake afterwards and have a little chat. You know, it's, it's really that simple, but that impactful. Jordan, thank you so much for sharing that. And I think, you know, to, to, to fit within the, of, of what I want, right. So state the clients need, right. They want someone, right. They, um, the mentee's need is that they need someone to, to care about them, right? To show them that they matter, right? And by showing up for one hour a week, you can help do that, right? And the benefits to you are X, Y, and Z. And I think that that's just really wonderful and truly what we try to hit home here at Mentor Rhode Island. Um, something I did not mention, which I guess we should have mentioned, Joanne, is that we were a little different in the affiliate network, which I think makes us the most fun to kind of run these workshops. So other affiliates that you may work with in your state they just support you. They support mentoring programs. Where we're a little different that we also run mentoring programs here at Mentor Rhode Island. So when you talk about that volunteer recruitment pitch and what that looks like and recruiting mentors and all of that, we're doing that here on the other side of the house. So not only are we supporting a network of 60 mentoring programs here in Rhode Island, but we're also uh, have direct service programs in a number of school districts throughout Rhode Island. So we're doing the work as well as helping those who do the work. So that makes us a little bit more fun and different. Mentor National doesn't really like it, I don't think, but it's okay. <laughs> um, anyone else want to share their pitch with us and what they came up with? 
Don't be afraid. I promise. I'm not that scary. All right. I won't make anyone else go. So again, really making sure that you are getting um, those three things out, because again, then that just perpetuates more questions, right? So you can get a, a person who may want to be a prospective mentor to say, tell me more about this, right? You don't want to give them too much information up front and overwhelm them, right? You want it to be a dialogue and a conversation. Well, so Chris, what you want to- can I, oh, you yes. the, can I put you on the spot? Of course. And that would be, and you don't have to, give us a pitch. Oh gosh. Well, I kind of did that a little bit with Jordan's, right? I kind of <laughs> helped to create a pitch out of that one, right? So yeah. they gave me a little bit more about like, here's what, you know, the, the mentees need is, right? All those things. I think I, I, I don't do the best job at following this formula as well as I should, mostly because a lot of the times I'm doing presentations. That's really where a lot of our, my work kind of goes I, into. I was just kidding. I was playing. Thanks a lot. <laughs> now for next time, I'm like, I'm going to have one ready to go. Oh, now I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and so what we want is when we talk about that, um, we want to create targeted recruitment materials. So again, address a specific audience, right? Who are we trying to get? Highlight expectations and eligibility, use visuals, and we want to keep it simple, right? The more information you give somebody, the more overwhelmed they're going to get about the idea. You don't want to not tell them everything up front, but you don't want to overwhelm them right off the bat when they maybe don't even understand what being a mentor entails. Next slide. So now we wanna talk about building your recruitment team. And when we talk about building our recruitment tree, team, there are five different categories that we wanna look at. So when you want to engage a recruitment team, you wanna look at your staff. Do your staff know about the program? How can we get staff out there talking about the program and recruiting mentors from their networks? What about board involvement? Who are the board members and do they know how to recruit mentors? Participants in the program, advisory groups that exist, and then any partnerships that you may have are all different ways that we can look at to engage a recruitment team. If you engaged two people from each of these groups, you'd already have 10 people out there talking about your program. How amazing would that be? 10 people plus yourself. Now that's 11 people. You engage another person from each one of these groups. Now that's 15 people plus yourself, 16, right? Talking about your program, recruiting mentors. And now you're tasked with only finding one mentor each instead of you're responsible to find 15 mentors for your program. So making sure that you have a team of people behind you out there recruiting, talking word, talking to different networks, getting into different communities, walking in different circles that provide a different experience is going to help you have a well-rounded program. But again, you need to get these people um, versed on your programs, goals and objectives. What are you hoping to get out of this and who are the people that you want in your mentor program? And then finally, what you wanna do is you wanna develop a recruitment plan. So you wanna first set goals. How many are you hoping to recruit and which strategies will you use to reach them? So you may say, you know, I wanna recruit 250 mentors a year. Well, you're gonna have to, again, diversify how you ask for mentors um, so that you can make sure that you can get to each one of them to get to that 250. If you go, if you're looking to get 250 mentors by putting ads in newspapers, one, you're only looking to get one kind of mentor. And two, you're not going to get very many because as many times you put in the newspaper, I don't think you'll get 250 mentors. So again, how can you diversify how you reach out to people and where you look for people to make sure that you can reach them in a bunch of different ways? And not only that, you want to set action steps. So what actions will you take to meet those goals of how many mentors you want to get? And then when will it happen and who will be responsible? So maybe I'm not the best person, even though I'm the recruitment person, maybe I'm not the best person to do this specific task of the recruitment plan because this person has this connection at this place. 
and they can get up and they can do a better pitch than I could to this person. So really thinking through and being really intentional about what is it that we're looking for. Okay. Final thoughts. We want to be strategic and planful in your recruitment efforts, right? It's fine to stand outside their grocery store and ask for mentors. Cool, great, wonderful. But you're not going to get the mentors that are going to stay in your program and that want to engage with the program in the way that you want them to engage. We want to set appropriate volunteer expectations from the beginning to ensure a successful experience with your program. And then finally, we want to say thank you. Whether or not a mentor gets into your program or not, right? They want to be a mentor. Say thank you for their time, for listening about your program because they may remember and think of your program down the line and they tell somebody else. So making sure that no matter what, at the end of the day, that you are creating that space um, and leaving a lasting impact on a person, you never know what seed you're planting. Questions. What questions do you have around recruitment? Anything that we haven't talked about? specific question. Um, so we've had a very difficult time recruiting male mentors. Um, we're in seven different, well, eight now different counties in Georgia. And I've had the hardest time. Sometimes I'll have gentlemen that will come and, and do our orientation because we do, we do, do have to do trainings and um, background checks and they'll get to the background check stage and they'll have gotten through every single process, but then they will get to the background check stage or it's, it's like that, last, that last step they need to do to get in the referral and they will stop. And I can't figure out how, I mean, I've, I've recruited at barbershops, I've recruited at um, the stadium theater, um, you know, anywhere that I could think that would have a, a, a larger male population. And I still, I, I, I hate having kids on my waiting list um, and they're typically boys. So I have a question about like just specifically recruiting male. Well, of course, men are the hardest to find because men have commitment issues, duh, <laughs> as a male. No, I'm just kidding. So, um, but in any event, sorry, my, my colleague is also laughing at me. Um, no, when we're thinking about recruiting male males, that is a hard one. We all have that problem. I'm sure there is no one on the call that's like, I have way too many male mentors. I don't know, again, that I have like the fix all for that, um, the magic sauce. What I will say is I'll go back and lean on what we've talked about previously, and that 23% of mentors are recruited by a friend. You must have males in your program already. So why not ask them if they have any male friends who want to get involved too? Try that. that. Be my, <laughs> right, and that we've tried that, right? Okay. So, and I, you know, you're talking about you're going to the places where men are, right? These are different things. Um, I know we see that Mash, a National has something uh, that they've put in the chat here around Thank recruiting you. male mentors. I think it's just continuing to try those different places and it's going time and time again, over and over. Oh, my internet is unstable. We love that. Um, going time and time again. Uh, Joanne, you were gonna. I was just gonna add that um, bringing one of your male mentors with you and making those pitches, even if it's not something like having them recruit their own friends, but having a man present may help Have you tried that, Jordan? That's a really great point. Um, I'll be completely honest with all of you on this call. I am the sole person that works with this mentoring program. So yeah. I do all the recruitment, do I do all the fundraising, I do all the sponsorships, I do all the matching, I do all the support for all the matches. So I, I, unfortunately, we, we're a nonprofit and we just don't have the funds to have any additional uh, workers, but that was a really great point that you made, and I, I, I feel like you're absolutely right with that. That that would be a helpful, um, helpful tool for me to have in my toolkit. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And the other thing, I'm just going to have you repeat after me: abundance. Just say it every day when you get up. Say the words abundance. Don't think about the scarcity of not having enough money for more staff mm -hmm. or whatever. Uh, we went on an abundance journey a few years back and we've increased our staff from six to 13 over the past year and a half, two years. So 
it's out there. You just have to believe it and it will come. That's my right. manifesting. Right. right? <laughs> <laughs> I think too, you know, again, we need to look at um, that recruitment team, right? You're the only person. So who else can be out there and helping you, whoever that is? I don't, is it a best friend? I don't know. Is it someone, you know, at one of these agencies? We have a couple of people saying fraternities and clubs, right? Um, places where men are. Um, you know, having a couple male champions on your side, I think could really help um, in that way, like Joanne was saying. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, but I, I, I honestly, I've reached out from commissioners, uh, governor, the governor of, of Atlanta to, like I said, barber shops. I mean, honestly, everywhere. And I just, it, it's just, I have, I just, I just got nine applications from, from boys in Loganville and I have zero mentors having kids on my waiting list and I I typically don't um but yeah it's just been I'm just wondering if you had any this was all this was all very helpful though thank you very much yeah and your marketing materials right being explicit we have a lot of people kind of coming in the chat saying here are some other ways right to get male mentors um I also think a lot of the times that you know the idea of mentoring can seem a little bit more female to people, um, that idea of caring and assisting and all of that. So really, how do we get people to reframe their mindset um, is something else there as well. Also, the age of the mentees may also be a difference. I have seen a lot more male mentors want to be matched with high school students than with elementary school students. So what is the age of the mentees that you're working with? Um, there's also a lot of men I've realized want those outcomes right away. So they want something where they want to meet those first couple of meetings and then they want to have seen some type of change. And you just don't get that with a younger kid as you might with an older kid. So who are you matching them with? I also am a big fan of finding a mentee, going up to a man and saying, here's a mentee I have for you, right? Here's what they're like. Here's what I know about you and your personality. And I think that this would be a good mentee for you and your fit. Um, and that really is, is really helpful. Definitely, and definitely something that helps. Um, Thank you other, so much. Oh, of course, other questions or other things, other, other recruitment issues people. Any other questions around recruitment? All right, so with that, turn it back over to Mel. Thank you, Christopher, and thank you, Joanne. Like you always rock it, and this was phenomenal. So kudos to you. Um, if folks wanna come off mute, give a little clap here. Um, I love hearing the claps um, for those who are hard of hearing these this here. Um, <laughs> I want to say, though, like all of this, everything that Joanne and Christopher share. Um, now, I will say they're the some of the best of the best in our uh, TA providing cadre. Um, but we have over 160 technical assistance providers that can assist you with recruitment practices, um, can assist you with the unique needs and work with you individually on your own program's needs. I'll be promoting this every day um, while we go through this, but the National Mentoring Resource Center is there for you. Um, OJJDP funds it to support you all, not just grantees, but just regular mentoring programs who might need help, you know, um, recruiting for male mentors. Our technical assistance providers are trained on these specific items. So I'm going to pop it inside the chat. Um, again, I'm going to be um, promoting this, excuse me, uh, every day, uh, you know, while we go along on this. But if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me um, or Christopher or Joanne. Um, I'm going to put my... Uh, dot org can't spell and type at the same time um it's uh but just know that we're here for you um we're here we want to support you uh we want you to be the best that you can be um that's kind of like my military background there 
best that you can be. Um, but it's uh, just know that OJJDP is here for you. Um, they invest quite a bit in mentoring and this is a free, no cost to you service. Um, and it's just, it's phenomenal. And I want you all to take um, part in it if you um, have the staff capacity to be able to um, um, to come tomorrow and Thursday. You can come all the days, everybody. We want everyone to be here. Um, so it'll be lots of fun. And so tomorrow we'll be screening and training. And then uh, Thursday we'll be matching, monitoring, and support and closure. Perfect. So, and if you have any issues, reach out to, to us directly. Um, again, you know, my email is right inside the chat there. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing you all tomorrow. It is tomorrow, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Have a good one, folks. Bye, everyone. Bye.